Hello everyone and welcome to the third session of online Explore Caltech Talks. Thank you very much for joining us today. I am Pablo Garrido Barros and I'm here with my colleague John Bostic and we are both postdoc at Caltech and co-chair of the Outreach Committee in the Caltech Postdoctoral Association. The aim of this online Explore Caltech Talks is to, is to reach out to the community and share with them the science that is done by Caltech students and researchers. Unfortunately, the in-person event was canceled this year due to the current situation, but we are excited to keep the Explore Caltech Talks online, given the importance that we think outreach has in the society. We would like to thank the people that have contributed to this event. First, a special thanks to the speakers who volunteered to show their interesting research with the community. This event wouldn't be possible without them. Also, thanks to the Caltech Postdoctoral Association and the Communication Office at Caltech for their help and support. I want to mention that this session is being recorded and it will be posted to the YouTube and linked to the Explore Caltech webpage as explore.caltech.edu. So you can come back to this video and check it out or if you couldn't assist to any of the previous events, you will also find that information or, or those videos there. After each talk, there will be a question and answer session. So you may submit your, uh, your question via the chat, or you can also use the raising your hand option, and we will give you access to ask your question. Finally, I would like to ask you please keep your video off and microphone muted during the speaker's talks. Now, John Bostic is gonna start to introduce our speakers today. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, I think we have an exciting group of speakers today. Um, the topics are ranging from energy storage to how the atmosphere uh, interacts with the oceans and tools to explore the ocean. Our first speaker today is Brian Lee. He's a graduate student in the chemistry and uh, chemical engineering division. And uh, he's gonna talk about uh, energy storage and batteries. Go ahead, Brian. Hi. Should I share my screen? Cool. That look all right. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Brian. I'm a chemistry PhD student in the C group. I work with Professor Kimberly C on developing next generation batteries for renewable energy. Uh, before we start, I was asked to talk about why I got into science and this research specifically. I got into chemistry research because I liked doing stuff with my hands, but I also like solving problems. So chemistry research was kind of a good meld of the two. I chose battery research because I think uh, its biggest appeal was that it's easy for me to see it being applied to real life. I think a lot of fundamental chemistry research is a little harder to do that. And for me, it was personally rewarding to be able to do that. And with that, I'll start. So before we, uh, before we start, I want to talk a little bit about how batteries work in the first place. So batteries are devices that can store electrical energy. They're in a lot of our handheld devices, like in our mobile phones and our laptop. And the way they work is pretty simple. You have two electrodes called an anode and a cathode. The anode is where the oxidation happens, or as in the electrons leave the anode. And the cathode is where reduction happens, or the electrons enter. In between the two electrodes, there's an electrolyte. Its sole purpose is to ferry ions back and forth. And so when you discharge your battery, you hook it up to your device, the electrons start leaving your anode, and it enters your device, and it does work in your device. Uh, so it powers your phone, you know, plays music and stuff like that. And then the electrons leave your device, enters your cathode, and then reduction happens at your cathode. While it happens, uh, electrons are negatively charged. So as your negatively charged particles move from the anode to the cathode, you have to have a charge balance. So for that, the positive ions, in this case, lithium ions, start moving from your anode to your cathode. Sorry. And uh, so on the right here, this is kind of the, what the chemical reactions are on the commercial lithium ion battery. So lithium ion batteries are the ones that go in your mobile phones and your laptops. At the anode, you have a lithium graphite material. So this is basically, imagine like your pencil lead 
with lithium ions uh, bonded to the graphite itself. From here, you lose electrons or you oxidize your lithium graphite, and then you end up at a, just a regular graphite with lithium ions. And then the electron will travel towards your cathode along with your lithium ion. Once the lithium ion and the electron reaches your cathode, it uh, reduces the cobalt oxide, which is at the cathode, to form lithium cobalt oxide. And this is how a lithium ion battery works. Uh, batteries we can use to power handheld devices, but we can also think about using them for renewable energy. Um, probably the most famous example of this would be battery powered electric vehicles, thanks to our buddy Elon Musk. Um, so if you look at this picture on the left, this is the heat map of nitrogen dioxide over LA County. Uh, this is from 2019, and this the bottom picture is from 2020. Due to obvious reasons, there has been far less cars that have been running in LA. And as a result, you can see that the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, which is a toxic gas and a big contributor to acid rain and smog, has dropped significantly uh, when there's less cars. You can also look at this, uh, this graph over here. Oh, I should use the laser pointer. There you go. Uh, if you look at this graph over here, this is the uh, carbon dioxide emission from a gasoline gas, a gasoline powered vehicle versus an electric vehicle. You can see that the CO2 emission from an electric vehicle is less than half of a gasoline. So this just shows you the advantage of eliminating uh, combustion engine vehicles and moving to a battery powered electric vehicle. We can also think about using batteries for renewable energy storage. Um, so we want to eliminate you know, fossil fuels in our power plants and move towards solar and wind energy power plants. One of the big issues with them is that their generation of energy fluctuates over time. So if you think about solar production, during the day, we can make energy just fine. But at night when the sun is down, we really can't make any electricity. But at night, we still need our AC and heat on, so we use electricity at night when we're not making any. So one possible solution is to generate uh, an excess of energy during the day, and then store this excess and uh, uh, use the stored energy to essentially last through the night when we can't make any energy. Uh, so lithium ion batteries are pretty much, I don't wanna say the best, but they are like the state of the art technology for batteries. But uh, there are some fundamental problems with lithium ion batteries that really, um, prevent us from using it for more uh, applications. One of the biggest problems with lithium ion batteries is cost. Uh, lithium and cobalt, which are both metals that go into producing our lithium ion batteries, are pretty rare metals and as a result, pretty expensive. So on the chart on the left here, you can see that electric vehicles are uh, on average 35% more expensive than in, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. And about 35% of an electric vehicle's cost is battery. So a Tesla is like something like $40,000. So if you think about 35% of that, it's $15,000, $17,000. That's a lot of money for just like a, a battery pack. And if we can eliminate a, uh, a lot of the cost of making the battery, then we can make electric vehicles cheaper, and which would you know, make it more, uh, so that more people would have it and increase the positive effects of electric vehicles. These pie charts represent the uh, lithium and cobalt product production over the world. You can see that, especially for cobalt, but also for lithium, most of the production is dominated by one or two countries, Congo for cobalt and Australia and Chile for uh, lithium. And this concentration uh, not only increases the cost, but also has some political implications. And in the case of Congo, uh, some humanitarian issues as well, because Congo is, uh, let's just say it has some questionable uh, child labor practices. So there's a, some humanitarian issues there too. Second problem with lithium-ion batteries is the safety aspect. So there's an inherent flaw in lithium-ion batteries in that, is that, in that uh, over time, as you discharge and recharge your battery, you can get what are called lithium dendrite growth at your anode. So lithium dendrites are essentially just spikes of dendrite that start growing from your anode and towards your cathode. Once the spike gets long enough that it reaches your cathode, it short circuits your entire battery. And as it short circuits, it gets hotter and hotter. And the electrolyte is made up of a flammable liquid, actually. So as your battery heats up, 
uh, it's liable to explode. So if you look at this picture here, this is a picture of Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Um, the black charred region actually is pretty much exactly where the battery sits. So it's, the battery blew up. Uh, most batteries have pretty good engineering from a separator and an electrolyte to minimize this dendrite effect, but it's a fundamental flaw and there's a pretty small chance that it'll happen with all devices. So that's not great. Uh, to address this cost issue, a lot of uh, battery chemists, battery scientists, think about replacing the lithium metals with more abundant metals, like zinc, calcium, and magnesium. So this chart here shows you the abundance of, all, uh, of a lot of the elements in the Earth's crust. You can see lithium and cobalt are sitting you know, somewhat rare, but you can see magnesium and calcium are much more common than lithium and cobalt. Zinc is about the same as lithium, but I'll touch it in a little bit, but it, as you can see in this production chart, zinc is a lot better spread out across the world. And so its uh, cost, as reflected by this chart over here, uh, is much cheaper. You can see the price of lithium carbonate is over double magnesium, and other metals are much cheaper than lithium. Uh, magnesium, if you look at it, it actually looks like it's, the production is skewed pretty heavily towards China. While production is concentrated, the reserves are actually pretty well spread out across the globe. And um, you know, as magnesium demand increases, people, uh, countries will start developing them. Matter of fact, the United States actually has started developing some magnesium production with, of its own. You'll notice that the calcium pie chart isn't on here. That's because there's so much calcium production over the world. Limestone is calcium, basically. And you know, there's way too much production for the US Geological Survey, which is where I got this data from, to even keep track. So they don't even bother trying. However, the biggest roadblock towards developing these batteries is that these, uh, these three metals are really different from lithium chemically. And so we don't really understand how they would react. We don't know how they would under, uh, work in a battery. So to be able to make batteries with these metals, we need to understand and we need more knowledge of how they would work. To address the safety aspect, um, we think about using solid electrolytes. So the reason why your battery blows up is because your uh, electrolyte is a flammable liquid. So if you can replace the flammable liquid with a non-flammable solid, then you know, it reduces the risk of having a portable bomb in your pocket. Um, another possible advantage of a, a solid electrolyte is that if you think about that spikes growing out of your anode, if you have a liquid there, there's really nothing physically blocking the spikes from growing in. But if you have a solid against your, electro, uh, your anode, then that physical, that electrolyte serves as a physical barrier in suppressing the growth of the spikes. So that could suppress dendrite formation. As I mentioned earlier, the sole purpose of an electrolyte is to allow ions to move through it. It's easy to think about that in a liquid electrolyte, but in a solid, you can still move ions through it just fine. As long as you have an ion that's in a solid network, and there's an empty spot next to it, it can just hop over uh, like an ion would move through a liquid. That doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's easy though. Now granted, there are some solid electrolytes out there that are about as good at conducting ions as liquids, but that's really rare and most materials are not very good at it. And so finding materials that are good enough to move these ions is pretty difficult. And this presents a major bottleneck in solid battery research. So in our group, and this is the project that I work on, uh, we think about killing two birds with one stone. And uh, we work on uh, developing solid batteries using zinc, calcium, or magnesium metals. So to that end, uh, Dr. Andy Mark Nolich, he's a postdoc in our lab, uh, he discovered that this material, ZMTS3, is able to conduct zinc ions at room temperature, and this is a solid. So uh, to our knowledge, this is the first reported room temperature solid zinc ion conductor. Um, this is the structure of the material. It's basically like a honeycomb material, a little flower petal motif uh, with layers. And this is kind of how the zinc would move. You have a zinc sitting in a flower petal, and by random chance, you have one of the flower petals that are missing the zinc and the zinc can just move away from one flower petal to the other. And this is how uh, the diffusion of ZMPS3 occurs. In, sorry, the diffusion of zinc occurs in ZMPS3. Now, as the first uh, solid room temperature zinc ion conductor, this material opens a lot of doors for further studies. So for example, we can study why this material conducts zinc in the first place and use that principle towards developing better electrolytes 
Uh, we can also, if we can find a cathode that can work with this material, then develop a, develop a uh, model battery system so we can study, you know, different reactions that occur at interfaces and stuff like that to eventually get towards a commercial solid zinc battery. So just to summarize, I'm going to end with a, a summary of ongoing work in our group. So as, as I mentioned before, uh, there's a section of our group that works on solid zinc, magnesium, or calcium batteries. Uh, we work at uh, discovering electrolyte materials as well as discovering cathode materials. Eventually, I build a model battery to study the solid uh, the electrode electrolyte interface to understand the reactivity of this system. We also have a, a, another group that uh, another subgroup that works on sulfur cathodes. So sulfur cathodes are very cheap and high capacity. And we study sulfur cathode batteries uh, using lithium and magnesium systems. So they work on developing electrolyte composition as well as studying the interface to try and get uh, sulfur cathodes to be a viable alternative. Uh, another subgroup works on developing higher cap capacity lithium cathodes. So they study um, different cathodes that we'll be able to use in lithium ion batteries to increase the capacity of these lithium batteries. Uh, they do this by using fundamentally different chemical reactions that uh, would occur in normal cathodes. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this event, Pablo and John. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, this is our group. Uh, this is our boss, Professor Kimberly C. She's good. I'd like to also like to point out uh, Dr. Andy Martin Olish. Andy and Zach were my two direct mentors on getting my feet wet in this project, and they've been really, really helpful. So thank you guys. And because it's the 21st century, I guess I'm obligated to point out that we do have a website and a Twitter if you want to check those out. And thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. That was a great uh, presentation, great talk about something very common and useful in our life, like batteries, but that normally people don't really know how they work and how they, can they be dangerous, as, uh, as you said. So I think now we have some time for some questions. I just want to remember that you can either upload the question uh, via the chat uh, feature or just raise your hand, also virtually. I think we have, uh, we can start with a question from uh, our co-host, John Bostic. John, uh, do you want to ask the question? Sure, thank you, Pablo. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, Brian. Uh, you talked about at the end, um, you still need to develop the, the cathode for the, for the zinc conductor. Uh -huh. What are important properties for that cathode? Uh, probably the biggest, uh, property is that it's reversible. So, you know, with lithium ion batteries, you need a discharge and then recharge. And that discharge and recharge, as I mentioned before, involves a chemical reaction. And a lot of materials, as it undergoes that chemical reaction of reduction and oxidation, it changes uh, the material, both like chemically and mechanically. And so as a result, it fails over time. So that's probably the biggest barrier, I would say. Okay, thank you. I think we have a, another very interesting question from Justin. Uh, uh, he's asking, will flow cell batteries be a better option for stationary batteries than lithium ions? Uh, that's an interesting question. I would say I don't know enough about flow batteries to really answer that question definitively. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know what else I can say. <laughs> Do you want to, to bet? Do you want to have a guess? <laughs> mm. I think I'm obligated to say I would bet on uh, these batteries, but I'm sure flow batteries have a, a good, like good things of their own. I think flow batteries are probably easier to maintain because you have like tanks of stuff flowing in. Um, but yeah, besides that, I don't really know too much about flow batteries. Okay. Um, okay. I also want to ask you. No. And I think it's like, what, in your opinion, you think is the uh, the main feature that determine the size of a battery? Because I think the size of a battery is one of the main issues in the development of, of practical devices. So what do you think is the, the main feature that uh, determine the size? Like, is the nature you mean like of the, the physical size of the battery pack? Yes, exactly. 
is the yeah, nature so, of the reaction or yes go ahead um i think that depends on the graph like what we call gravimetric capacity which is how much charge per gram of i guess battery will be able to hold and that really depends inherently on the what the electrode materials are so lithium ion batteries are gated because the anode has to be lithium graphite and lithium graphite is not very high capacity. So that's kind of what makes lithium batteries uh, inefficient as far as size per uh, capacity goes. So that's another part of the reason actually why we work on these like magnesium, zinc, and calcium batteries is because they have much higher theoretical capacity. So by that, I mean like the same volume of battery, not volumes, same mass of battery will be able to hold more uh, energy. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So, well, yes, I want to thank you again for these great talks. And I think it's time then to, to move to, to the, our next speaker. Yes, and our next speaker is Michael Kipp. And he's a postdoc in geochemistry in the Geological and Planetary Sciences Division. And he's going to present a topic on uh, atmospheric gases and uh, the marine environment interactions. Go ahead, Michael. Great, I'll share my screen here. And then, all righty. Um, so yeah, I'm a postdoc here in uh, geological and planetary sciences. I'm working with uh, Francois Tissot, who's a new faculty member, and Jess Adkins. Uh, and the project I'm here to work on is sort of motivated by this question, uh, where does atmospheric CO2 go during ice ages? Um, and what sort of drew me to this topic is that in my PhD, I used to study um, very long-term, million to billion year scale evolution of Earth's climate and how that impacted, say, the evolution of life. Um, and here I'm going to focus on much shorter time scales, at least relatively speaking, um, centennial to millennial scale climate changes and study ice ages or glacial interglacial cycles and also try to use that to better understand uh, future climate change. So I'll talk about that at the end. Um, I'm going to motivate this um, with this picture here. This is a picture taken flying over southern Greenland and you're seeing these enormous ice sheets, icebergs calving off of them, taking sediment pieces of the mountains, uh, rafting them into the ocean, being deposited in sediments. Um, there's a whole host of geological processes um, that occur near glaciers that are very uh, well characterized today. But this actually was not very well understood or understood at all uh, just in the mid 1800s. And uh, I'll just, no. There we go. And actually the process of discovering that there even were ice ages was sort of an interesting um, story. So it took very strange um, geological oddities such as these enormous rocks that are occurring out of context. Uh, they're made of material that's not the same as the rock beneath them. They are not located near any sort of topography or natural source for the, these rocks. Um, and they really posed a, a puzzle for geologists in the 1800s. They at first hypothesized these might have been deposited by a global flood. Um, and eventually though, in large part due to the work of uh, Louis Agassiz in the late 1800s, it was realized that these are glacially deposited uh, features. We call them now glacial erratics. And actually the way that they uh, arrive in their present location is that they are carried by enormous ice sheets, things that were kilometer thick, um, masses of ice over northern Europe and North America, places like New York and Chicago. Um, these were carried by these ice sheets left in their uh, place as the ice sheets melted and receded. Um, and so the recognition of these sorts of geological features is actually how we discovered that there even was a time in the past um, that was a, a glacial period. Um, but this was, you know, like I said, in the late 1800s, and we've come a, a really long way in our understanding of what an ice age actually is. Uh, and there are two major discoveries in the last century, in the second half of the 1900s, that really um, shaped our understanding of these uh, phenomena. So the first one was this seminal paper by Hayes, Imbri, and Shackleton, where what they did is reconstructed the temperature uh, of the Earth through time. And the exact way they did that is not so critical here. They uh, measured oxygen isotopes 
and these benthic foraminifera. So these are organisms that um, biomineralize calcium carbonate in the ocean. And the isotopes of oxygen, when they get incorporated into that carbonate, it's actually a temperature sensitive process. So values, um, lower values that are actually plotted towards the top here mean warmer temperatures. And then these values would imply colder temperatures. And when they looked at sediment cores, they saw that there were these fluctuations occurring uh, between warmer and colder temperatures. And they weren't just occurring um, randomly, but they actually looked at the period uh, of this fluctuation. Uh, and they saw that actually there were these um, peaks, uh, periodicity of 100,000 years, 40,000, and 20,000 that corresponded very closely to known fluctuations in Earth's orbit, uh, which actually decades before were hypothesized to be drivers of uh, climate fluctuations. So this basically showed not only were there ice ages or temperature and climate fluctuations, but these occur regularly. Um, we now know these have been happening for over 2 million years. And we have a mechanism that's driving them. It's changes in the Earth's orbit, very small changes in the mean tilt, for instance. So this was a big step forward, but actually uh, there's a, a missing piece in the puzzle here. You can directly calculate the amount of temperature change you would get from these small orbital fluctuations, and it's actually way too little to account for the massive expansion of ice sheets that uh, was observed. And so we knew um, at this time even that there must have been some feedbacks in the Earth system to amplify um, the, the climate impact. And the natural candidate was that greenhouse gas concentrations would change as well, uh, since we knew by that point that they played a critical role in keeping the Earth warm. And so the second major discovery that really solidified our view of these uh, glacial interglacial cycles was um, the construction of continuous records, um, mostly coming from ice cores. In this case, this paper is reporting data from an ice core drilled in Vostok, Antarctica. And the measurement of uh, air bubbles trapped in this ice, reaching back in this case over 400,000 years, allowed us for the first time to show that not only are there these temperature fluctuations, that's the second curve from the previous study, for instance, that I showed, um, but they were able to measure atmospheric CO2 levels, uh, which is the dominant greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. And it correlates very strongly with these temperature fluctuations. Higher CO2 levels correspond to warmer temperatures. And so at this point, then we had a pretty clear understanding that atmospheric greenhouse gases like CO2 fluctuate with global temperature. And this can explain the ice age. And today we have drilled many more ice cores. We have measured many more oxygen isotopes in marine sediments. And we have a pretty clear understanding that there are these colder and warmer periods. Here in blue, I've denoted these glacial periods with low CO2 and low temperature. Uh, and it might seem like that's the whole story there, but there's actually a really um, large looming mystery about all of this, which is that we don't have a great answer for where all of that CO2 goes. Uh, we know that there's this difference of 100 parts per million, give or take, uh, in the concentration in the atmosphere. Um, but it's remained somewhat puzzling exactly where you put all of that carbon dioxide. And so uh, that is what I'm working on here. And it's um, partially because what we think we know about the carbon cycle is that it, it fluctuates on relatively long time scales. So here's uh, just a figure from a, a textbook from not too long ago that's showing what we call the long-term carbon cycle. Um, CO2, for instance, it's uh, being added to the Earth's surface through volcanoes, through the heating of old rocks, through the weathering of rocks, and this all brings it into the ocean atmosphere system. And it's removed from the ocean atmosphere system by being deposited in marine sediments, and those can get subducted back into the Earth and the cycle can go around. But the balance of these inputs and outputs actually fluctuates on million year time scales. So it's much too long to explain the glacial interglacial cycles where we see CO2 rising in around uh, you know, century to millennial timeframes. So um, just recognizing this, um, even decades ago, uh, Earth scientists were realizing that any change on glacial interglacial time scales in CO2 is probably um, explained by partitioning of atmospheric and ocean uh, dissolved CO2. So basically, can you take that CO2 and stuff it into the ocean during the ice age? Um, so the paper that first sort of outlined this idea was published in 1984, and this is their you know, very simple box model view of what was going on. They said, here's one reservoir, the atmosphere that has carbon, and here's the ocean. And if you can put this carbon into the ocean, specifically the deep ocean, a separate box, 
maybe you can explain the glacial interglacial cycles. And they had uh, good reason to think this might be the case. Um, so what they're invoking is this, I, this mechanism called the biological pump, which you can imagine for a second, this box is the ocean, here's depth, uh, so going down a few kilometers. Uh, what's happening in the, in the surface ocean is that you have phytoplankton, or things that are doing photosynthesis. They're using light energy to split water molecules and give electrons to CO2 so they can make organic matter, their biomass. And as a byproduct, they create oxygen that gets dissolved. So it's produced uh, in the water column. And then as these organisms sink, their biomass moves through the water column. There is secondary production or heterotrophy, respiration going on, where there are organisms that do the exact back reaction. They use the oxygen that was produced by the photosynthesizers to oxidize the organic matter, and they release the CO2 back into the water column. So it, what the biological pump is doing is taking CO2 that's in the surface ocean and it's pumping it down to the deep ocean where it can get stored. And so if you have more, a more effective biological pump, a stronger biological pump, you can basically pull atmospheric CO2 into the ocean. Now, this is an important realization because not only then might we be storing carbon in the deep ocean during ice ages, but for every molecule of carbon dioxide that's supposed to be in the deep ocean at that time, we know that you must have consumed one molecule of oxygen. And so this has led some to hypothesize that in the last ice age or during any of these glacial periods, you might have had oxygen depletion going on in deep waters in the ocean. Now, this is, like I said, important because it's been very difficult to quantify the amount of carbon stored in ancient seawater. It's, a, it's just a very difficult um, question to get at. But since we know that we can equate every molecule of CO2 to a molecule of oxygen lost, then maybe we can just target the amount of oxygen that was missing in ancient seawater and then infer whether all the carbon dioxide was actually probably there. And um, this is very handy because in fact, oxygen is very reactive and there are many ways we can study the oxygen deficit of ancient seawater. And so uh, how do we do that? that? That's really what I spend my time doing in the lab and uh, through modeling. And I'll just very quickly show you guys an example of how we sort of approach that at Caltech. Um, so what I'm studying here are deep sea corals. They, they look like this. This is the species Desmophyllum dianthus, holding one here for scale. Uh, they're called deep sea corals because they grow very deep at kilometer depths or more in the ocean. And what they do is precipitate calcium carbonate, taking calcium and carbonate ions from seawater. So they are in many ways a direct archive of seawater chemistry. Um, and for our purposes here, what's helpful is that they incorporate also a lot of trace constituents, uh, some of which are oxygen sensitive. So their properties in seawater can be related to the amount of oxygen. And in this case, I'm gonna focus on uranium and how it can tell us about oxygen. So not only do these grow today, um, but we actually can assemble a record of ancient seawater chemistry because you can recover fossilized deep sea corals reaching back through previous ice ages. Um, so here again, I've zoomed in the time scale now. Here are the last two glacial interglacial cycles with the CO2 and two sites from which um, Jess Adkins, whom, uh, who's a collaborator on this project, has recovered um, dozens, and at this case, uh, at this point, probably hundreds of samples reaching back over 200,000 years, uh, at least one of the sites. And so our goal is going to be to use these trace constituents, again, uranium in this case, to reconstruct oxygen across these cycles. Um, so very, very briefly, the idea, the reason we could do that is that we are measuring the isotopes of uranium, um, the different forms. There's a mass 238 and 235 uranium that we care about. And uh, in the simplest sense, the partitioning of those isotopes has to do with the removal in um, sediments that are either oxygen depleted or not oxygen depleted. And what we can do is use equations such as these to relate the isotopic composition of uranium in seawater, so the amount of 238 relative to 235, to the relative importance of these different sinks. And therefore, if you know this value, you can say how much of the seafloor is anoxic, for instance. So our goal is to measure these fossilized corals, which we know based on studies of modern corals will record the seawater value. And using that, then we can calculate the amount of seafloor that was anoxic uh, in the past. 
So I haven't gotten to that point yet because I've actually spent a fair bit of my time here as a postdoc in quarantine. Um, so these are not real data, but this is sort of an illustrative um, example of what we might find. And I've done some modeling to show the sort of constraints we could get. Um, so here's ranging from a very minimal signal to something large. And what we'll aim to do basically is fit these data with a model that can then tell us something about the evolution of um, seafloor anoxia. And then we could look at any given time point. Here I'm showing a histogram from uh, what we call the last glacial maximum, which is the peak of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago. And we can see these different scenarios imply either near modern levels of seafloor anoxia, which is in the gray band, or higher values. Uh, and if we couple those sorts of constraints to um, 3D sort of general circulation models, you could actually uh, use that constraint on oxygen levels to say something perhaps then about um, the amount of carbon stored in the deep ocean. So uh, stay tuned on that front. And then um, lastly, just to take a step back and talk about why else we might care about this, it's not just to understand how ice ages work. But we've actually observed um, oxygen depletion in the ocean in the previous decades actually leading up to the present and it's expected to continue as we keep pumping more CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, so just to give you a sense of scale, here's the end of that trajectory, here's the last glacial interglacial cycle. There is a difference of 100 parts per million CO2 between the last ice age when there was kilometer thick ice over New York City and uh, the year 1700. And we've added more than that much CO2 to the atmosphere since 1700. So clearly, if we want to understand the impact of a human uh, CO2 emissions on um, the marine environment, we need to better understand the relationship between CO2, oxygen depletion, and climate. Um, so with that, uh, we don't have a nice lab picture yet because we're a pretty young group, but uh, thanks all for tuning in, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. That was a really good talk and really impressive how you managed to get so much information and correlate all with things that happened a lot a long ago. So now it's time for question. And we have a question it's saying, uh, where do you find the fossilized uh, deep sea corals? Oh, where can you? So yeah. these um, two sample sets that I was talking about here, uh, they recovered from sea mounts, um, some near um, Tasmania and some in the North Atlantic. Um, and actually this might play well into the, the next talk. Um, there's some cool ways that you can um, recover these using uh, uh, robotics and you know, basically you're going down on submarine dives to recover these things. Um, so that is not personally what I've been involved with, but that's been you know, decades of work to uh, locate these sample archives and recover um, you know, dozens and now hundreds of fossil corals. Okay, thank you. So I also saw one hand rise. Yes, uh, Dominique. Okay, yes, uh, let me, yep. yes, I think you can go yep. ahead. Yep. Thank you very much. This was a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I'm interested you mentioned you, you're interested in kind of the difference between the isotopes you see in uranium, but I'm, so as far as I understand, usually isotopes don't show up in chemical, uh, they don't show much of a chemical difference. So I'm very interested in how, uh, what's the fundamental process by you measure different isotope concentration depending on the oxygen level? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so by and large, um, chemically speaking, isotopes do behave similarly. So we can refer to all of uranium as a single you know, element that has a certain behavior. But uh, at the very fine scale, there are very minute differences in the, uh, basically the reactivity or the partitioning of different isotopes into different bonding environments. Um, so in the case of uranium, it's a bit strange actually. Um, the way that this happens because it's a, an extremely heavy element um, and so there's a very small difference between the masses um, but in just as a general rule in isotope geochemistry you tend to get um, heavier isotopes preferentially sitting in stronger bonding environments and you can actually calculate this um, 
theoretically, and it corresponds very well to the measured isotope effect a lot of times, but these are uh, expressed in parts per thousand um, relative differences in, in the largest case, and in some kind uh, instances, parts per million. So very small differences in their uh, chemistry. Does that help? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, I have a last question. So I'm interested to know what is the way so that you can correlate certain observation with a certain uh, time in the past? So how do you get this time resolve evolution? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So yeah, this all presupposes that we can know exactly when, say, a fossil coral um, lived. And there are a few radiometric dating tools that you can use. Um, so in this time frame, we're within the realm of um, radiocarbon dating being valid, but that's it's actually an interesting uh, story that doesn't work as easily as you might expect for dating things in the ocean, particularly carbonates that are precipitated, uh, precipitated directly from seawater. Because that carbon, there's some lag time, it sits in the ocean for a while, and the amount of time that it's spending in the ocean, that residence time can change, and the mixing time of the ocean can also change. So you can radiocarbon date all of these corals, and they tell you something about the age, but also something about um, ocean mixing. But to get an even clearer sense of the age, you can do uranium series dating, which is not um, as affected by those processes. And so a combination of those two methods is how the dating for these corals has uh, taken place. Okay, sounds good. Perfect. Okay, so thank you again for participating and sharing your science with us. That was a great talk. And I think it's time then to move to our next speaker. So our final speaker, uh, will be uh, Lily Dove. She's a graduate student in environmental science and engineering, and she's going to introduce some tools to help us study the oceans. Go ahead, Lily. Great, thank you. One second. All right, is that looking good? I guess so. Um, so thank you very much to uh, Pablo and John for putting this on. Um, it's really exciting to get to share some work and to hear what other people are working on. Um, so I was asked to share a little bit about why I'm an oceanographer. Um, and it's mostly because I've always been really interested in earth science generally. Um, and I think that our planet is the greatest gift we have um, and anything I can do to help understand it better and help make life better for the people who live on it, um, I will do. Um, and so let me get started telling you a bit about how physical oceanographers um, explore a blue planet. Um, uh, Michael did mention that there are a lot of other methods um, to sampling biological, um, samples in the ocean. Um, I will not be talking about those, but those are extremely interesting as well. Um, so first I want to motivate you a little bit about why it's important to understand or study the, um, study the ocean at all. Um, and the answer is climate change. Um, so we are putting enormous amounts of carbon dioxide um, and other greenhouse gases into our atmosphere um, due to fossil fuel usage, um, cement production, um, and other uh, anthropogenic changes. Um, and the majority of the um, heat um, and carbon um, that, is, that we are emitting is going into the ocean. And so I'm plotting, I, I'm showing here um, global anthropogenic carbon emissions um, and also land and ocean surface temperatures. And you can see that land and surface ocean temperatures have been rising um, in the last couple hundred years. And this has had major impacts um, and profound changes um, on, on oceanic systems, um, including but not limited to ocean acidification, which is affecting corals, um, sea level rise, which is uh, threatening coastal communities um, and threatening uh, erosion. Um, shrinking marine habitats due to deoxygenation, um, it disruptions to fisheries, which is impacting people's livelihoods, um, resulting in, and also resulting in harmful algal blooms, um, which can 
impact all of these things. And so this is a very complex system and it requires um, for some complex solutions to how we, as to how we study um, these systems. Um, so how do we measure all of these oceanic properties that we're interested in? I'm gonna give you a bit of a historical background and then give you a bit of a 20,000 foot overview of what we are doing now. Um, so historically, um, we've used uh, ships um, and that's still true today, but ships look a little different. Uh, so this is a ship from approximately the 1750s. Um, and I'm plotting over on the left, um, on the y-axis is depth. So as you go um, down the axis, you get deeper in the water column. Um, and plotted on the x-axis is temperature. And so each, all of these different lines are from different um, studies done at this same point um, in, the, in the North Atlantic. Um, over a couple of different cent uh, a couple of different uh, decades and then also a couple of different centuries. So the red dots are corresponding to um, a study done by um, some British folks uh, on the ship the Earl of Halifax. Um, and you can see that they had some um, potentially some inaccuracies in how they were measuring as they were basically putting a bucket over the side of the ship putting it down to depth and then hauling it back up on board again and then quickly measuring the temperature. So I could give you some error, but overall they did a pretty impressive job at getting the profile um, of the measurements correct. Um, luckily, things have evolved and changed um, and have, have made things uh, easier for oceanographers to get more accurate measurements. Um, so over on the right is a state-of-the-art um, icebreaker that the National Science Foundation charters and that I actually was just on for the last couple months. I got back in April. Um, and on the left, I'm plotting um, the Pacific Ocean overlaid with the tracks um, designated by the World Hydrographic Atlas. So a bunch of people got together um, and decided, hey, instead of allowing for ships of opportunity to go and, you know, sample water wherever they wanted, let's make this a little more organized and do some tracks um, along the ocean. Um, and uh, it's pretty impressive what they managed to do. So what I'm going to show you next is a plot of what the data that uh, we got from this World Hydrographic Atlas looks like. So each of these points is representing how many data points we have at that spot. And you can see that the coasts are extremely well covered. That's because countries have great interest in um, the economic value of the waters near them. Um, and that, you know, there is some coverage in the global, in the global oceans, um, and that's pretty good. But what I'm gonna show you next is um, even more impressive um, and is a result of the Argo program that I'll be talking next. So get a picture of this in your mind. And here's what it looks like now. Um, and so you can see that we've really covered these open ocean spots. There are still some missing profiles definitely in the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean are definitely lacking. Um, but it is very impressive that we have this many profiles. These are all vertical profiles, which tell us um, what different tracers look like um, at depth in the ocean. And all of these measurements are a result of the Argo program. So Argo um, is a, uh, an organization that's, um, that works to deploy floats um, in around the global oceans. So the way these floats work um, is that they uh, spend some time at the surface and transmit data back to via satellite to their home base. Then they descend to 1,000 meters in depth and they travel along with the currents um, at that depth for about 10 days. And then they descend to 2,000 meters depth and return to the surface. And during that, um, during that vertical rise, they collect data on temperature and salinity um, and other, other important um, data points. There's also a movement um, to collect more biological and chemically relevant tracers. Um, and that is moving forward um, because we've seen great success with how these um, 
how these autonomous vehicles work. So over on the right are some pictures of one of these, uh, one of these floats, um, one of the biogeochemical floats actually being deployed. And you can see it's just about the right height um, for, for a shorter human. And it's very exciting when they go in the water um, because we know that there's gonna be really exciting data coming back from them. So these floats give us really interesting data on 10-day uh, timescales, but what about shorter timescales? Um, so this is where some uh, data that we're collecting here at Caltech comes in. Um, so we use sea gliders, um, which are developed by a company called Kongsberg, and they work pretty similarly to the floats, where they come to the surface, they beam back their data, they collect um, information about where we want the Float of the glider to go next. They descend to a thousand meters. They come back to the surface. All that time, they're collecting uh, the data we want them to collect, and then they beam back to the. They come back to the surface and beam back their data again. Uh, and so these are extremely versatile and useful, use, useful tools um, for understanding the upper one thousand meters of the ocean. And over on the right is a picture of me and a colleague. Um, putting together a glider um, that we were just about to deploy. Um, we deployed this glider in the Southern Ocean in the Bellingshausen Sea um, off the coast of Antarctica um, from January through March um, this year and got some really great results. There's also been recent development um, in developing even more autonomous vehicles. So I'm showing some pictures here of the Hugen, um, uh, Hugen autonomous vehicle that's developed by also by Kongsberg. And these vehicles are extremely impressive in that they are, you can tell them exactly where you want them to go, what depths you want them to go to. They can collect water samples along the way. Um, they're very versatile. They're also very new. Um, and so there's, uh, very limited data coming uh, or available from them right now, but they're fascinating. And one of the most interesting things is that they're able to go underneath ice shelves. Um, and so the International Kuwait's Glacier Collaboration, which is an organization looking to understand one of the most um, fragile ice shelves on our planet, Kuwait's Glacier, um, has deployed one of these uh, vehicles and was able to get it to go underneath the ice shelf and collect um, data that has never been collected before. So these are kind of the future in terms of um, uh, oceanographic research. I would be remiss, um, these are not autonomous vehicles, um, but they are very adorable. Um, so seals and, um, are already doing this work. They're already going to a thousand meters depth and already going up and down and doing profiles in the ocean. And so some very smart scientists said, let's work together. Um, and so you can see on the left, this is a um, southern elephant seal that has a tag attached to its head. Um, this tag measures temperature and salinity and depth. Um, and just like the gliders and the floats, whenever the seal comes to the surface, the data beams back via satellite. Um, and it's a mutually beneficial uh, cross-species um, collaboration um, in that we also get information about how, uh, where these seals breed and what, where they're eating um, and are better able to um, provide information about how we can better conserve very, these animals' habitats. Um, and the good, another good thing that, um, is that the tag is only attach them for one year. Uh, seals molt every year and so when they molt the tag comes off. Um, so we get our data and uh, it's a, a really cool stuff to look at. Um, I think it's also important since because of Caltech's connection to JPL to mention how important um, and vital satellites have been um, in allowing oceanographers to uh, perform our research. So I'm showing uh, on the left, uh, this is uh, Aqua, the Aqua satellite that was uh, launched in 2002. Um, and one of the instruments on Aqua gives us ocean color data, which I is plotted on this full map scale here. Um, and so this is a measure of chlorophyll A concentrations um, in the ocean. Um, 
And this is vital for telling us about phytoplankton blooms, where they're happening, how they're evolving, um, what they look like in time and space. Um, and because the satellite is collecting these images all the time, it's a really rich data source um, for oceanographic research. And there are many other satellites. Um, we don't just use ocean color, we also use sea surface temperature, sea surface height, um, many other satellites that are part of the Earth observing network, Earth observing system um, that make oceanographic research possible. Bringing us from this full global view to a little bit back closer to home, um, this is an image from the NASA Earth Observatory, which demonstrates these beautiful phytoplankton blooms we can see right off of the coast of California. Um, and using satellites and using float data, um, ship-based data, glider data, all of these different um, data sources, we're able to really put the puzzle pieces together about how the coastal current um, is interacting with biology and chemistry um, to uh, make all of these beautiful features possible and uh, allow us to understand what impact they're having um, both on our climate and uh, on our people. So thank you all very much for your time. Um, and I'm wondering what questions you have. Yeah, thank you very much, Lily. That was a very illustrative talk. And uh, I'm sure it was an amazing experience to be out there in the ocean. Yeah. yeah in that boat. Yes. So, okay, let's go for a question now to see if someone in the audience has. Uh, we got a question. Uh, how do oceanographers decide which of these types of, of instrument to use? That's a really great question. Um, one of the things we consider is definitely what temporal and spatial scales we're looking at. So if you're trying to look at um, a large scale um, feature um, and its evolution, you might use satellite data or you might use float data just because it's, you don't need really coarse or high resolution data to look at those processes. But if you're looking at small scale processes that happen on the order of hours or days, um, you're not going to be able to get that information from um, float profiles um, or from many ship surveys. Um, so you would want to use a glider or um, another potentially autonomous vehicle. Okay, specifically in your group, what is the reason of, for using the, the current uh, device that you are using? So you, uh, can you explain a little bit more on that? Sure. Um, so we are, we mostly focus on research with gliders, um, which are the uh, instruments that yo-yo back and forth between the surface and a thousand meters depth. Um, there are several reasons we do this. Um, one is that we are focused uh, on processes that are occurring between the air, air sea interface um, and the mixed layer depth. So the ocean has a mixed layer and then the subsurface ocean. Um, and we're interested in the transition zone between those two. And that usually happens in the upper couple hundred meters. And so these um, instruments give us really high resolution data from um, in that area. And we're also interested in um, processes that happen on short temporal scales um, and how those processes affect uh, distributions of different um, variables in the ocean. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let's see. I have also one question for you. So what makes uh, studying the deep uh, ocean interesting compared to, for example, the coast? That's a good question. Are you thinking about the open ocean or about the deep ocean? Uh, well, I guess it would be interesting to know about both. <laughs> sure. Um, so I'll start by comparing the coastal ocean and the open ocean. Um, so the coastal ocean is really um, is not my field of expertise, but it's very uh, defined by runoff processes um, from rivers um, and uh, interactions with the continental shelf. And so we see a lot of um, <clears throat> a lot of biological production happening on these coasts because of um, upwelling nutrients coming up to the surface um, and 
nutrients and nutrients running off from rivers into the ocean. And so um, very dynamic systems in the uh, on coastal on coastal regions. Um, in the open ocean, um, you are, I mean, you have whole wide scales of variability. You have variability that's occurring on millennial time scales as water goes down into the, into the deep ocean and doesn't come back up to the surface for a thousand years, uh, all the way down to um, variability occurring on the order of days as, as eddies spin and interact with each other. Um, and of course, to some extent, each of these processes happens on the coast or in the open ocean. Um, and so it's hard to disentangle the two at times. Um, but there are some, there are some differences. Uh, and then the deep ocean um, is de definitely not my field of expertise, but is very difficult to sample, um, partially because you need to design an instrument that can withstand extreme pressure. Um, and you also need to be able to access uh, the open ocean at a 4,000 meters depth. Um, and so it's very interesting because we don't know a lot about it. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think that was everything regarding questions. So I think now John wants to say some words before finishing. Thanks again, Lily, for your talk. That was a very interesting talk. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lily, and, and thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, this, this is our last session for the month of May, uh, but because of interest in these talks, uh, Pablo and I will organize some more talks in the coming months, and we're, we're starting to recruit speakers for those talks, so we're excited about that. And um, you may find the videos for these first three sessions on YouTube in the Caltech uh, Caltech YouTube channel, or you can search Explore Caltech on YouTube. Anything else to add, Pablo? No, I think that was everything. So we are excited to be able to continue with Explore Caltech in the following uh, months. Um, and yes, just reminding uh, audience that if they, they want to still uh, join for for this exciting series of, of talks they can do it we are gonna send more information on that uh, uh, in the future and yes we have to see many interested people that we can keep this series of talks going on and, and entertain people with outreach coming from caltech okay thank you everyone